Hey, Bill, thanks for being on the show. Hey, glad to be here, Jay. So I'm really excited to have you on the show because I think that the knowledge and wisdom and the things that you teach every single day are really the kind of things that people really need help with. Um, and to be honest, uh, this is super transparent, but I'll tell you because you'll appreciate this and people, people listening might as well. Uh, we've had an exceptional year profitability wise, but I've not managed a company this big before. And a couple of weeks ago, I had a real cash crunch of the kind that I was like, man, I cannot believe I let this happen. Um, and we made it through that little window, but it was because I really wasn't managing my cash flow properly, forecasting my cash flow, I should say, mm -hmm. and you know, with all these kind of things, profitability and cash flow and all that kind of stuff that I think a lot of business owners get stuck on. Is that right? Oh, there's no question about it. Well, you know, I say in, in every one of our programs, right, companies run a P&L out of their accounting program and the, and the profit loss says we're making money. We must be okay. Mm -hmm. right? Your P&L will lie to you every day of the week. Yes, right? it will. We can tell you you're making money even though you're broke, right? That's you right. have to run the business as, as you experience, right? Based on the cash flowing into and flowing out of the checkbook on a daily basis. Yeah, and it's, it's crazy because <laughs> I feel super transparent even admitting that, that I've made that mistake recently because I preach this stuff. Like I understand it from a technical standpoint. And I could teach somebody else, but all of a sudden I realized that there were a few things that we had left off from a forecasting standpoint that I hadn't planned for. And even though we're exceptionally profitable, I ended up in a real tight cash crunch just because of the way the dollars flowed. And that can be a big problem for a lot of people. And it's exciting to have you on the show because I'd love to dig into some of those things. But before we do, I want to rewind because I always, the purpose of this show is to give other entrepreneurs and business owners kind of a peek behind the curtain of the sure. reality of running a business, building something ultimately that lasts the test of time. And, and you guys at Grandian and Associates have certainly done it. You've been in business for decades. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd love to hear just kind of behind the scenes, a little bit behind your story. You didn't start the business, but you've been there for a long time. Yeah. Um, and, and what's your transition been like into the role that you have now? Well, it's interesting. You know, I, I never in my life did I dream that I would be here, right? That I'd be doing this. Uh, my background was in heating and cooling. That's what I went to school for eons ago and, you know, and, and got out of there. And I spent 22 years in wholesale distribution uh, with a, a, a leading HVAC distributor. And, and I spent the first 15 years of that in the field, right? Mm -hmm. So I spent my time in basements and crawl spaces and attic spaces and rooftop units and, 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 and scraped my skin off uh, the knuckles, uh, you know, right along with the, 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 our contractors who were in the field. And um, it was interesting because the first day I started, the president of our company said, uh, Bill, you got to know two things about this role. He said, number one, um, we're not hiring you to be in the, uh, in the office. We're hiring you to be in the field, right? So I knew I was going to be out and about. And, and second one, he told me, it was kind of interesting. He said, uh, you can do your job any way that you feel you need to, as long as my phone doesn't ring. Hmm. Because if our customers feel that they have to call me to resolve an issue, then you and I have a problem. <laughs> right. So, you know, went about doing that and I found out pretty quickly I could either be reactive and every time one of our customers had a problem, jump in the car, go out there, help them figure out what was wrong. Or I could be proactive and, and, and come up with ways to teach them how to recognize the problem so that when it came up, they already knew how to resolve it. And I didn't have to get involved. And so I spent a lot less time in the car doing that. And so you know, I basically put together programs where I was teaching in, in, in four and five different cities a week, right? And I, I'd, I'd put these programs together and I'd work all day, you know, visiting customers and that night I'd teach classes. And, and I did this uh, you know, every year and, 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 and it paid fruit in a big way. Well, yeah, I did that for 15 years and then moved over into the sales and marketing side of our company. Now we were a, at that point, a $60 million company. And what I found is that um, I missed being in front of the classroom, mm. right? When I was teaching, I could see the light bulb go on. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I've got you know, all the, the, these business owners and, and technicians looking at me and, and when the light bulb clicked, I knew it. It was there. They got it. And to me, that was a drug, right? That, that really, uh, that's why I did what I did. Mm -hmm. And when I moved over into the sales and marketing side, all that was gone. Yeah. Right. And, and, and some people are fueled by the big sale, right? Some people are fueled by uh, uh, really, you know, you know, making things, you know, happen within the company. Me, it was helping this guy get it. 
Mm. Right. And I missed that. And so after eight years of doing that, and quite frankly, being groomed for uh, you know, the, 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 the presidency of the company, I, uh, one day it hit me this. I had no passion for that. Mm. I didn't want to do that. So I, I, I opted to, to, to leave the company, but just wasn't sure where I was going to go. And, and at the same time, I was also trying to, uh, to help our contractors be more profitable because if you think about it in distribution, your role in life, you're a middleman, right? So your distribution is to try and get people profitable enough to you know, make some money and buy stuff from you and pay you for it. Uh, and so as I was doing that, I stumbled across Tom Grandy and, and uh, this business training that he did. And I actually hired Tom to come in and do some training. And as he taught that first workshop, I knew, right? In fact, on day number two, Tom and I went out to dinner and I asked him, you know, tell me a little bit about his story. And uh, I went home that night and told, called my wife from the hotel room and I said, I don't know where, don't know when, but at some point that man and I will be working together. Hmm. And three years later, I left the, dist uh, left the, the company I was with uh, joined Grandy Associates at that point, and and I worked alongside Tom at that point for about seven years. Now the the, the uh, I you know, took on more and more of the responsibility of the company, but it's after about seven years. Now this is a company who's been here for a couple of decades already at this point. Mm. Uh, you know, and Tom had a very entrenched way of doing things. Um, but as many company owners have experienced, um, if you're not calling the shots, sometimes it can be a little bit unfulfilling. There's always, you know, the new guy coming up always has this uh, idea of how you could do things better. Right. And I don't necessarily know that my way would be better. It was just totally different. Mm. And, and, and so uh, ultimately when, when Tom and I came to the agreement and I bought the company from him, uh, you know, we're now at this point, um, you know, 28 years in, um, a very loyal following of, of contractors across the, across the U S and Canada. And, uh, um, you know, you talk about some, you know, that, you know, having a profitable year and, um, uh, but being broke, um, I had to learn that same thing, Yeah. right? We're teaching this every day, but like you said, sometimes putting into practice, what we teach isn't always easy to do, right? It's easy to tell somebody else what they need to do. It's a <laughs> so easy. Right. That's right. right. And so yeah, there was a, a pretty major learning curve at that point. And, and, and the other thing is that, you know, when, when, you know, my predecessor owned the company, um, you know, and, and, and Tom is still with us today. He's still active in the company. Um, he's just not in that leadership role. Uh, when he owned it, it was a one-man company for all practical purposes. He had one revenue generator. He had some office staff, but one, he was the revenue generator. In effect, at that point, you own a JLB. Yeah. Right? You own a job, and I didn't want to own a job because that in itself, I identified pretty quickly. That was one of my shortcomings is, is that if I was the only one producing, then I couldn't stop producing. Mm -hmm. Because the moment you stop producing, the moment the revenue stops coming in, and that creates a whole other host of problems. And so um, I didn't want to do that. I wanted something more for what I was doing. Mm -hmm. right? I wanted to own a company, not a job. So that, those were some, some pretty major uh, struggles and, 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 and things that I had to change at, uh, you know, as we went through the, uh, those, those first several years of the company here. Um, and, and my company today looks totally different. I mean, it's nothing like the company that we bought uh, years ago. Yeah, it's amazing to just think about that journey. So many things I want to unpack from, from just the things you're just talking about. The first is the idea of knowledge versus execution. Mm -hmm one thing to know something, it's another to actually do something about it. And I think one of the things that happens too, when you're starting, not, not that you were starting a new business, but you, you kind of are when you, over time, I feel like even for oh, me, yeah. I've, been in, I've been doing the same business for 20 years, but it's nothing like the business that it was even five years ago, certainly not like it was 10 years ago. So I feel like I'm constantly starting a new business within my business, kind of, you know, well, there's no question about it because, you know, again, if you look at it, even if five years ago, you were the best at what you did in your market, mm -hmm. there was nobody who could touch you five years. If you're doing things the exact same way today, you're eating somebody else's dust. Yeah. Right. Because they are always changing, always improving. The market is changing. And if you're not changing with it, you're getting left behind. And yeah. so you're, you have to completely you know, you know, reinvent and, and change and improve what you're doing on a daily basis. Because if you're not, Again, you're not going to survive. 
Well, talk about uh, something specifically that stood out is you talked about how much you love teaching. And it's interesting because I'm actually dealing with this struggle a little bit right now myself in that I, lo that, that I love to teach. Like I love being on stage, teaching in front of a big group. I love teaching a small group. I love teaching one on one with a client and helping them figure out stuff. Mm -hmm. Most of that for me is around the marketing sphere, but a lot of times it branches off because business is just one big interconnected web. But I'm also struggling with like, there's only so many hours in a week and right. you know, I have a wife and children and you know, all these other kind of things. And I have a business that has to be run outside of me being in the classroom as you do as well. So mm -hmm. when you first started at Granny, you're doing a lot of teaching and you're still doing a lot of teaching, but you're also running a company. Mm -hmm. so how do you figure out that balance of going, Hey, how much time am I in the classroom? How much time am I running the business? You know, for me, it, you know, that varies all the time. But one of the, one of the biggest struggles that I had, right? So early on that I had to learn is, you know, I was still a one man company. Mm -hmm. I was still, yeah, time was there, but the model that we pretty much had at that point is, you, you know, it's a typical sales model, right? You, you, you eat what you kill, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what I found myself doing is I didn't have a lot of work. And so I'd be, I'd be calling and marketing and, and, and calling and talking to people and doing all this other stuff. And then and I'm finally starting to get some bookings. Well, then I go teach. And when I'm teaching, there's no time to be calling. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I teach, 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 teach. And then, and then that all of a sudden that whole stretch is done. Then I look up one day and I've got nothing on the calendar. And, you know, and again, if you stop teaching, you stop producing, there's no money coming in. And so that, you know, I found at that point, the hills and valleys were so severe. It was yep. feast or famine. And, and it was hard to function that way. Um, and so I had, that's where, again, I got away. Yeah. That, that same point kept coming back to me, right? I didn't want to own a job. Mm -hmm. and, and if I needed to smooth, if I was going to have any chance of smoothing things out, it had to be bigger than me. And so one of the things that I had to do was to, to really look um, at other ways of bringing in revenue without me standing in front of a group. Mm -hmm. right? And one of the things that I did, it, you know, it, it struck me in two ways. The first of those was I went to, my wife and I had gone to a, an Entree Leadership Master Series class and, and Dave Ramsey and I had a conversation and I expressed that concern to him at that point. And, and he said, I remember those days. <laughs> and he said, the first thing, what, the first thing I did that, that really helped me in that piece is to figure out another way to do it. How could I deliver this? Right. And he said, and at that point I set up a camera and I recorded myself and, and I started selling the recordings. <laughs> Right. So that gave a, a method. Right. So it started you know, planting a seed a little bit, but it also meant so we started to do a little bit of work um, with with recording and, and selling those. But but really, the big thing was I needed to hire another one of me. Mm -hmm. right? And so what I ended up having to do was to get an, other producers out there. Now, today, you know, we've grown and and, and there's uh, you know, there's there's you know, three other producers, uh, uh, teachers, coaches in the field who are our revenue generators, that enables me to step back a little bit yeah. um, and, and spend a little bit more time in two areas that you mentioned. The first one of those is running the company, mm -hmm. right? The old, you know, uh, Gerber, right? Work on your business, not in your business. And, and, yep. and I really had to get to that point. Um, and the second thing was to be able to have a little bit of family time, mm -hmm. right? Because, because I had a couple of years in there where family was really, um, uh, that was stretched pretty thin. And, and so, you, you know, I had to focus on that piece of it. And, and that's, a, you know, I find that's always the struggle is that piece is how do you, um, uh, I tell business owners, let me put it this way. I tell business owners all the time, you don't have to grow. It's okay to be small, mm -hmm. right? You can stay where you're at, but if you do want to grow, uh, um, th then you have to, figure out a way to no longer be the producer. Okay. And, and so in my case, the way that that looks is um, I still do a lot of keynote addresses. I do a lot of conferences where it gets me in front of contractors. I can do some teaching at that point in time. Um, and, and then I, I, I intentionally reserve a couple of uh, targeted workshops that, that uh, it, it's a real benefit to the company if I'm the one there teaching it. Mm -hmm. Right. My other trainers can do as good a job. In some cases, they can do a better job than I can, right? Um, in, in teaching those programs, but every once in a while, there's an element there where it, it benefits to have me. I'll be intentional about picking those, right? But um, you know, one of the things that I had to do, and, and, and this helped not only the business, but it helped my family, is 
I literally had my administrative uh, assistant go into my calendar and block out every Monday and Friday mm -hmm. from, you know, throughout our entire cycle, right? So for us and our company, summer is our slow time. Our clients are all too busy in the middle of summer to, to go attend track classes. So uh, we kind of get a break and I can stay home. But, but we went through Labor Day all the way through Memorial Day and she blocked out every Monday and Friday. And, and that meant that I was not going to be teaching on a Monday or Friday. That gave me time yeah, more time in the office. It meant I didn't have to travel on weekends. It meant that, uh, yeah, again, I had a little bit of sanity, right? Because if you don't create some space, you know, in the head, you, you, in the mind, then, then it's tough for you to keep track of all that stuff. And so, again, if, if, if you want to grow, you, you can't be the lid, right? If I want to work in the business, then, then, then again, that's okay, but then I'm the lid, right? I'm the one who's preventing that growth. And, and that's a conscious decision that you have to make. Right. Do I want to be small? If so, there's a trade off. Yeah, gosh, <laughs> I feel like you dropped about five or six different knowledge bombs. I don't want people to miss them. Uh, the first one, when you're talking about working on the business, uh, not in the business, and the whole idea of job versus business, you talked about Gerber. Some people may not have heard of that. Um, it's a book that's very popular called E Myth. If you've not read this, if you're thinking about starting a business or even if you've been in business, you must read that book. It's an absolute, absolute, like, buy it right now today over anything else and go read it. Um, the other was knowing when to scale. I think that anybody out there who has run a business for any period of time has experienced exactly what you said. Uh, I've experienced it both without a team and with a team mm -hmm. where you don't have enough business. So you get out there and you hustle and you go find more business. Mm -hmm. And then what happens if you're good at that, uh, you get too much business and now you got to go do the work to actually achieve whatever you sold. Now you're going to go and you're going to kind of hunker back down. You're doing the work but you're not going to get more business. And there's no, right. there's no systems in place to, to smooth that out. And there are some ways to do that, even with a smaller, even as an individual, but it's almost, it feels almost impossible with, until you start to have the right people around you to kind of right. delegate out, okay, I have somebody that's always working on developing new business. I have somebody mm -hmm. who's always working on doing things that are revenue drivers. The other thing you talked about was- And if I can, Jay, in there, it all, that also introduces fear. Yeah, right? for sure. Because uh, okay, when I'm in all of a sudden that famine mode where all of a sudden I've done all the work and there's nothing there and there's no, nothing else coming in, uh, I still got the house payment. I still got the grocery yeah. bills and the doctor bills and, and, and yeah, it's just me, or, you know, but it, all of a sudden it changes the way you run the company because you're operating from a position of fear. Yeah, which is super dangerous. And I've done it before and gosh, every time that I do, it usually doesn't end very well. That's and right. It, and it, it, you have to get out of that. The, the other thing you talked about, which I want to make sure people don't miss these things because they're really important is understanding why you're growing. Mm -hmm. It is so easy. I've done this too, of, to grow for growth's sake, whether that's to hit a revenue number or a profit number or a people number or a client number or whatever the number is that you're chasing, especially if you're one of those high, high achiever type mm -hmm. personalities. But it is, it can be dangerous to do that because a lot of times you end up in places where you're not, you're not prepared to be there yet. And right. you achieve these growth goals, but you go sit back and you go, well, why am I doing this? I mean, I had a season where I'd hired a bunch of extra people, but I really wasn't, and I was really good at growing revenue, but I was still trying to, I was just barely growing the profitability at that point. And it's like, well, gosh, I just grew my overhead by, you know, a hundred percent and grew my profitability by, you know, 3%. Is that worth it? Mm -hmm. Probably not, you know, and it's up to each person to know why to grow is really important. The other one you mentioned, two more things, because I just want to draw them back in. Yep. Time blocks is huge. You talked about that in your schedules. If you're not doing that out there and you're listening, you got to do that and multiple revenue streams. I mean, Bill, I think you and I both will attest to that is one of the number one secrets, if you will, of lasting a long period of time is having those multiple revenue streams because there's always going to be a time where one of those gets a little bit more contracted mm -hmm. um, than the other. So I'd love to, for you to talk about that a little bit more because I think it's so important when you were starting to try to figure out what were those other revenue streams going to be, mm -hmm. how did you kind of come to those solutions? How did, how did you start to figure out what those revenue streams might, might be for you? And what are those revenue streams for you? Well, you know, I have to admit that, you know, the first one was, was obviously uh, just doing some recording because uh, uh, I figured if it worked for Dame Ramsey, it'll work for Bill Kennard. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but, but quite frankly, struggled with that a little bit, right? Because knowing how to do that. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm an HVAC guy. So how do I know how to, you know, put together something like that? Uh, at the same time, um, you know, it's looking for some of those other opportunities. And, 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 you know, we mentioned earlier this idea about having to 
uh, kind of reinvent yourself, you know, all the time, right? What, what do we look like? What are we doing? How are we doing things? You know, as we started to look forward a little bit, I started looking at, um, you know, really what was happening in the market and, and, and uh, you know, again, finding people, you know, amongst our client base, the trades industry, there's such a shortage of people at that point. So that puts a pinch point on, on, on the business owners uh, and, and how do we make that happen? How do we get their people up to speed a little bit quicker? And so that's one of the things I started looking at down the road a little bit is, is what could happen if they didn't have to travel, if they could, you know, attend the training from their place, right? And at that point, you know, we could uh, start to put together uh, individual training programs. So we, you know, went out and found out what to, you know, getting into, into e-learning a little bit. You know, so this online uh, uh, learning, self-paced online stuff. But I also knew full well that, uh, you know, the, the times that I recorded a video and just played that video, um, the, the, sitting, sitting and listening, you don't always learn near as much as if you have to participate in it. It's but I tend to be an interactive learner. And so I wanted you know, my training to be the same way. So how could I get it there? And so, you know, that's when we started to, to deal with the, uh, the different platforms that we could create self-paced interactive training. So, you know, we started to put together training programs that uh, the student has to interact with it at least every, you know, three minutes, you know, it, whether it's, it's answer a multiple choice question or drag and drop something, but they have to interact with it and participate. They can't just let it sit and play in the background while the mind is wandering. And so that was one of the first things. And we saw some successes there. Um, and then, you know, again, I, I had mentioned earlier that family was taking a real uh, hit, family time, uh, because I was finding myself traveling six and seven days a week. Mm. Uh, in some cases, I get home on Saturday and have to, you know, change the luggage over and, and leave on Sunday. And and my wife didn't want to be a single person. And so yeah, how do I be able to do more of what I'm doing without traveling? And so we figured out a way uh, to utilize the internet, utilize the tools that we had to be able to teach, you know, and using platforms like the one that you and I are talking on today to be able to teach remotely. I figured if I could do a one-on-one -on -one meeting, there had to be a way I could figure out how to do a, a, a classroom type training. Yeah, absolutely. Training. And so we, we, uh, spent a little bit of money and, 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 uh, and, and little, right? You, you, with technology today, you don't need a lot of money to, and we put in a studio here uh, in our offices with a green screen. And, and so I can go and stand in front of the green screen and I, and I can teach uh, um, just about any one of our programs live mm -hmm. from there. And, 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 and so started to do a little bit of that. So now I got revenue coming in where I can go home at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, but then from there, that just started to mushroom a little bit more because again, if I can teach it from here at this location, um, I can teach it from anywhere. Hmm. And so now some of our, even though our, our, our other coaches and trainers aren't located here in Green Bay, Wisconsin, where we are, um, there are other places in the country. Uh, now I've got other instructors teaching those same remote online classes. So I've just now hit two items. Number one, not only do I not have to travel, my trainers don't have to travel and we're still collecting revenue from wherever they are. And so those, you know, it, it just continues to grow in that fashion. And, and so uh, we're putting a lot of emphasis today on not only, you know, to converting much of the content that we have into online type programs. Sorry about that. Uh, so uh, you, you know, have that uh, uh, in place. And so the more we can do that, I think the, the, the more use it gets. And today that's becoming a, a, a fairly substantial part of our revenue uh, for the company as a whole. Yeah, and I think it's interesting because whenever you start new things like that, what, what can be difficult, I think, for somebody who's been in business for a long time is they've got this, you know, golden egg over here where the vast majority of the revenue comes in. Yep. And they start this new thing over here and it's really not producing that much. And at first it's probably taken a lot of time and energy because mm -hmm. we're doing something like live stream, you're going to figure out what camera you need and how are you going to get it online? How are the people right. going to sign up for it? And there's all these other questions that you haven't dealt with before where you just had to show up and be in front of a room. Um, and so those barriers can often prevent people from moving forward. And I know for me, we've had plenty of situations like that. And, and, and I think figuring out, when to press through that pain of, mm -hmm. of the early startup and, and when to let it die can be really hard. Um, how have you in those scenarios kind of 
thought through, hey, is this something we need to keep fighting through and, and it's just in the early stages or something we need to go ahead and just kind of put on the shelf and, and maybe look at it again in a couple of years? Well, you know, again, I think that, um, you know, there's two elements to that. Um, one of them, uh, because you have to deliver what you're delivering, right? You still have to maintain the level of professionalism and quality in everything that you do, right? Mm -hmm. And, 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 and so I was striving for that quite a bit in some of the, the, the platforms that I was delivering. And, and I heard a line at one point, right? Uh, uh, yeah, at some point, you have to ship. Mm, right? That's right. You, you don't let perfection stop you. Mm -hmm. Right? Sometimes good enough is good enough. And so uh, um, I had to look at what we were doing. And, you know, even today, there's things that we're doing that I, I, um, that I look at and go, it could be better but it would be another $5,000. Well, it is, it is acceptable. That's right. Right. And, and so that was one of the things that I had to look at quite a bit. And, and so are we still delivering the quality or is it just not up to, you know, it, it, is it not up to standards or is it not up to my standards? Cause sometimes mine can be a little bit too high. Right. And, and there's a little bit of a difference, right. When I go back and start polling our customers and that was one of the things that we started doing is, okay. Uh, uh, what did you think? Tell me about uh, uh, the content that you, th that we delivered, right. Did it meet your expectations? Did it, you know, what, uh, um, what's your one big takeaway from it? What, what are the things that you would omit from it? Right. Getting their feedback at that point starts to tell me that, okay, even though it may not be at the standard of the level quality that I want it to, it's hitting the mark. Yeah. And so that to me is, it, it tells me, okay, we press on, right? We keep doing this, even though the revenue isn't quite there. Um, and so that was one of those, uh, those elements that we had to uh, uh, certainly, you know, keep factoring. And it is, can we deliver it? Can we start to bring in some revenue, even though it's not exactly where we want it to be? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that, that that stuff is really huge. And I deal with this a lot on our end because we have, you know, we build websites for clients. You know, mm -hmm. they actually built yours. Um, right. Grandinassociates.com. If anybody wants to go check it out, it's a great looking site. Uh, yes, if I do say so myself. Um, is that we end up in a lot of situations where clients get months into a project and they, you can tell they're that perfectionist personality mm -hmm. and they just don't want to launch the website because it's not quite where they want it to be. And I always tell them like, look, I dealt with the same problem with our own website. Mm -hmm. I got into it. My team had to go, hey, you're doing the same thing to us that our clients do to us, which is just nitpicking it to a point where like it, what is there right now in draft mode that nobody in the world can see except for us is so much better than our existing website that's already sitting out there. Mm -hmm. Just launch the thing and we'll keep making it better. And this podcast is a perfect example. I mean, if you go back and listen to some of the early episodes, the audio was bad. I didn't even record video. Now I record video. But my first couple of video recordings, I was basically like in a closet almost in our office, essentially. <laughs> now I have a video studio. And, you know, so I just think it's that I, I always say, and my, I tell this to my team all the time, it's progress over perfection. Yep. Um, and some personality types have a really hard time with that. And we still have to produce a good product. It still has to be, right. there's a certain level that's like a minimum, like it has to be at this level or we can't, it can't be seen. You know, you can't have a bunch of spelling errors out there. You can't have inaccurate information. You can't have a video feed that's not loading, you know, um, that kind of stuff. Yeah, we, we worked with, a, with, with another company with a software product uh, for several years within this company. And, and, and the, uh, the gentleman who designed and owned the software, right? we did the marketing and training for it, uh, but the gentleman who owned and designed it was that perfectionist. Mm -hmm. And he would not allow... I mean, it had to be 100% before he would release it. And, and the problem was that it took forever to get any changes, to get improvements, anything out there. And, and it, because again, it was never, I mean, you know better than anybody with software, you're never at 100%. Never. And so, uh, quite frankly, this incredibly awesome tool which, which could help contractors in a major way died by the vine mm -hmm. because yeah. they, they, you know, there's two problems. Number one, it had to be perfect and th therefore he'd never release it. And therefore he had no revenue coming in. Right. And, 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 and he's going, well, I can't sell it until it's perfect. Well, I'm, you know, again, unfortunately this incredible yeah. software is, is not in the industry anymore today as a result of that. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's, that happens all the time. But I also, I also will say, I had an old pastor who always used to say, people often fall off one side of cl- the cliff or the other. Mm-hmm. And I also have other clients, um, one of which who you know and I love deeply, but <laughs> I want you to say my name, who <laughs> likes to just go, hey, let's just launch it. And I'm like, well, hold on. Yeah, yes, I want to launch it, but man, we're not even close. Like it's, it, there's a certain level of, let's just, let's just push it out there and see what happens. And I'm like, okay, I, I get it, but like, let, let's just, let's get some more details done. And I'm not the detail guy either. Sure. Um, but so there is that, like, there's that balance. But I also think that's where the value of having a really good team in place comes into play. So somebody else can double check it and see you from the outside. And that's what my team did with our own website. And they're mm-hmm. like, Jay, you're, you're doing that. I'm like, okay, that's fair. You're right. It's, it's better than what we have out there. There's nothing that's grossly inaccurate. Let's launch the thing. And mm-hmm. then let's, Make it, let's look at some real data and keep making it better. Yep. Um, totally agree with you. But that's hard. So you can fall off either side of the cliff for sure. Yep. Gosh, I feel like we've covered so much. Um, and I, what I really appreciate, Bill, about this conversation for you is, is just the transparency of like running a business is hard. You yeah. know, like there's a lot of moving parts. And, and even somebody like you who really knows the intricacies of how to manage the numbers and, 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 and how you literally teach other people how mm-hmm. to be profitable in their business. And yet there's still seasons where like, that's what I do. Like I teach people to do, do, do their own marketing. I teach them how to clarify their message. And there's still times where I'm like, man, we're, oh, gosh, how are we missing this? You know, it's so easy for that to happen. So um, what I'd love to hear, what, what I always like to transition to at some point, you talked about this a little bit earlier that, that you went through a season where you had a real hard time finding the balance. It's hundred percent work and zero family, or maybe it's 95% work and 5% family, or mm-hmm. there's all these different buckets of life. I feel like there's mm-hmm. you know, you've got your own personal health. You've got friends, you've got faith, you've got family, which is then kind of broken up into further buckets of spouse and children and everybody's demographic and setup is a little bit different, but the whole work life balance thing is something that's thrown out there a lot. I, I really yeah. don't like that word because I don't think it's about balance. I think it's about seasons of life. I agree. But I'd love to hear your perspective of, you, know, you talked about time blocking a little bit, and that obviously helps. But what are the, some of the things that you've kind of done to go, hey, how can I protect my marriage mm-hmm. while running a profitable business? Uh, what are some of the things that have worked or not worked for you? Well, you know what? One of the things that hit me, Jay, was, you know, again, I have this passion for, um, you know, running a business can be fun. Right. It can be scary, but it can be fun. That's right. Challenging, but it can be fun. Right. You know, there's all these things in there. And, 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 you know, again, with, with, with our you know, mission is to be able to teach these business owners really to, to have the life that they dreamed of when they went into business. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, my wife and I call it the swan dive that we took off the cliff uh, the day that I, I, I quit my role of 22 years, uh, you know, being very well paid and, 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 venturing into this thing called entrepreneurship, right? And, yeah. and you got this vision of what your life is going to look like, right? And how things are going to go. And, um, and that was you know, really what we desire to teach other business owners, right? Mm-hmm. How do we get to that point? And one day, you know, as I'm sitting in yet another hotel over a weekend, right? And, and having you know, a, a um, you know, a, a short conversation with my wife, because at that point, you know, we're not talking a whole lot because of, you know, hey, I'm never around. What do I know what's going on at home, right? And so, you know, it's all that. And, and finally, it dawned on me going, wait a minute, what about that vision that we had for our company when we started it, mm. right? We're teaching other people how to do the stuff that we're not living ourselves. Yeah. And, and, and I don't want to do that, right? Mm. You know, uh, the you know, I always said I couldn't be on the road as much as I was when our kids were little. Um, but it's even more important when I think about it to, to not be on the road as much when our kids are gone. Hmm. Right. Because again, my wife didn't go into this to be a single, right. uh, you know, a single person. And, and so um, part of it is just that realization, where are you are, you know, what is your why, right? What do you want? What, what, what's driving you, right? What is, that thing that you're looking for. And I want for me and my family, and quite frankly, every employee in this company, I want them to have that piece of the puzzle, right? So, um, you know, as you said, work-life, I don't like the term work-life balance because it's not balanced, right? It is seasons, Um, you know. uh, So, 
you know, we're, we're going to, not only are we going to be intentional about, about blocking time off and, and doing that, um, we're also, right, so, you know, within the company here, we, uh, um, we're very cognizant, right? It, it, everybody here who's got anything to do with booking my schedule is aware of that struggle, right? And so sometimes, you know, uh, Lori or Paul will come to me and go, Bill, you're entertaining this request to book this class. How does that fit in with what you were doing? Mm. Right. That's going to put you out of town four days that week. Is that what you want? Right. And so I've got team members here who are challenging me to remember that balance piece of the puzzle. Um, but then at the same time. Right. So so it, it's part of it is being cognizant on, on my part. Uh, it's part of you know, the communication between my wife and I right, to make sure that we're uh, uh, that we're on the same page as part of it with my team, keeping me accountable for that uh, kind of that schedule. But then quite frankly is, so here, you know, my team absolutely busts it uh, during the heat of the tra training season. And mm -hmm. so uh, when we come to the, uh, the you know, the, the, the slower time, um, we work four, four and a half days a week right now. Uh, we're going to give everybody long weekends on a regular basis. Um, we're going to uh, do things that are fun uh, outside of that because they're working too hard, right? And, and, and because so many business owners forget that piece of the puzzle. It's, what do I want out of this thing? Right. And, and, and I ask, you know, ask every uh, business owner at classes I teach, do you want to do this until the day they put you in the ground? Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, in reality, the answer is no. Right. Which means at some point we've got to be getting, you know, taking something out of it. Now, um, you know, if business owners don't want that. I will promise you their employees don't want it either. Yeah. Right. So what, what are you doing within your company to basically give that same season, right, a balance, again, if we use that word, to the rest of your team. Because I don't want to work them, you know, uh, to, to the bone either, right? If, if they've got an issue, because, it, you know, if they're not, if they don't have that sense of home life either and the happiness there, they're not productive at work. Yeah, that's for sure. Right? If we have somebody here, it's family first here all the time, right? If, if, if we have a a team member who's got a family issue. Okay, then why are you here? Mm -hmm. right? Go take care of that issue, right? Because if you're worried about that, you're not productive here. So, you know, get out of here and take care of that, right? And, 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 and as business owners, sometimes we have to remember that we just need to apply some of our same company policies to us as well, right. right? Give ourselves permission to take that day off and, and just be aware of that piece. Uh, you know, as you were talking, there were a couple of things that kind of made me think about and uh, I came up with this little analogy. So when I put it in a book, you can remember that it came from my inter our interview. <laughs> but it's the ABCs of business accountability. So this are ABCs of, of seasons of business. Have an accountable team. That's A. Yep. Block your schedule. That's B. Mm -hmm. And commit to your Y. That's C. Ah, uh, I like I think, that. <laughs> <laughs> so I came from our interview. So when you see that show up in a book somewhere, you'll know where it came from. Um, I think that what you're saying is so true. And, you know, when you think about that conversation where you said you sat down with your wife and you're kind of like, Hey, what's going on here? It's that like initial communication and commitment, but it's also accountability, right? Mm -hmm. It's your wife or your team member or somebody else being able to look at you and go, Bill, like, this is not what we planned. This is not what you planned. This is, is this what you wanted? You know? And, and you've been able to go, Oh, well, no, no I guess it's not. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of the reality of the fact that most people listening to this podcast um, live in the United States, uh, we have so much freedom, mm -hmm. so much opportunity to go, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to change gears. Right. And uh, in certain seasons of business, that sometimes means letting go of uh, services that you liked, but didn't fit within your why. It means letting go of people sometimes that or don't fit into that spectrum. It means trying to figure out something new. I've been saying a lot lately because it's been resonating with me. When you run out of money, you can always go get more money. You can mm -hmm. go make some more sales. You can start a side business. You, you can find a way to go get more money when you lose it. And people that go completely bankrupt, there's plenty of stories. Oh, Dave Ramsey's one of them. Goes completely bankrupt and then becomes a multi-mega millionaire. Right. Um, but once you spend your time, you can't go get more of it. Mm -hmm. We've all got a limited finite amount of time. And we don't even know how long that is. That's the other thing is we don't even know what's in the bank. I might, this might be the last day that I get to do a podcast. Uh, hopefully it's not. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know. But I think that that is a really important thing to think about as a business owner, mm-hmm. both for you and for your team. But I thought you made a good point too of, of saying, hey, some of these things we apply to our team, we might not do for ourselves. And I think that's why there is uh, maybe a little bit of a hidden um, problem within the entrepreneurial community of just mental health mm-hmm. of small business owners because they bear that whole burden of everything on their own shoulders. They're not taking the time to get that mental headspace that you talked about earlier. Yeah, there's, there's no question about that. You know, one of the things that uh, early on, right, I remember talking to my CPA and, and, and a guy's name was Bob. And he said, yeah, I said, Bob, man, sometimes I feel like I'm just hanging out here all by myself, right? I just wish I had somebody to, to bounce some ideas off of. Mm. And, um, you know, and, and am I running my business the way that I should? Am I being as profitable as I can? And, and, and there were two things that he, uh, uh, he, he impressed on me. It is number one, um, there's always a way to make more money. That's right. Right. And, and sometimes so many business owners, you know, uh, they, they, they get their, their foot stuck in the hamster wheel and they got to keep running and running and running and running because that's the only way we can make the money. There's more ways to make money. Yeah. Right. And, and so, but sometimes we got to, we got to do things different, right? You know, the old adage, right? If you want something to change, you got to change something. And so, you know, you have to try something different. Right. And, 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 and there's always a different way. Don't get so caught up in the way that you do it or the industry does it or my trade does it or whatever else is. There's always a different way. Right. There aren't a lot of other trainers who have the full fledged green screen in the studio. Right. Uh, because the, that was a little bit different way. Um, second thing is uh, that he told me is that um, uh, is, is uh, he goes, well, I'll play that role for you. He goes, I'll, you know, if you call it a mentor, call it yeah, another set of eyes, call it whatever you want, right? Uh, I'll play that role for you uh, under, under two, uh, two conditions. Number one, he said, uh, you will send me your financials every month. Hmm. And I'm going, wait a minute, I got to share my financials with somebody else. And he goes, you will share me your, fi- by the fifth of the month, you will send me your financials every month. And by the 10th of the month, you and I will sit down face to face, nose to nose, toe to toe, and we will go over your numbers. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting because uh, in, in that particular time, um, he wouldn't just look at my, you know, the, the, the financials and say, oh, boy, you had a lousy month. That sucks, right? Uh, you know, he'd go through and go, wait a minute. Two months ago, you told me this number was going to change because you were doing X. It didn't change. Why? Mm-hmm. Right? So that, that accountability thing mm-hmm. was so important. And having that mentor there to kind of challenge me in the way that I thought and the way that I did things um, did more to get me outside of my bubble, outside of my box than any other thing that I did. Now, it's interesting. We haven't met, right? He's retired a long time ago. Um, We still walk through that same process as a company today amongst our leadership team. Uh, Here, uh, every month, we call it our monthly financial review. We do that and we kind of hold each other accountable. And and there's things, uh, you know, again, part of it is Right, and we might be deviating just a little bit, but getting those okay. right people here, right? I'm a visionary type person, right? I can see big picture. I don't see details. I intentionally went and looked for an operations manager who's a detail guy, mm-hmm. right? And so there's times that I've got this wild idea that I want to do, and Paul's going, yeah, really? Right, and, and, and where are we going to, how are we going to pay for that one? <laughs> right, you know, and, and it just doesn't make a lot of sense right. to return on that, right? In the meantime, Paul's going, you know, we can't spend any money, right? Because we got, you know, these things coming up and going, if we're that tight, we're never going to grow, right? Okay. And so we balance each other really, really well. And, and that's important uh, to have somebody else that you can bounce stuff off of. Even though Paul and I walk through that, I still have another business leader that I talk to on a regular basis that, again, enables me, to, you know, challenges me in, in the way that I'm thinking. Those two couple of things are important to do because part of the way they're challenging me is again, coming right back full circle. Okay. And how is that going to impact your personal life? Yeah. It's so interesting because it, it's, I've been talking about this a lot lately with this idea that everybody needs somebody to mentor them. Somebody's mm-hmm. kind of holding them accountable. We all need people on our peer level, similar businesses owners and similar levels to kind of talk through things. And we all need somebody to mentee, somebody that we're kind of shepherding up. And I think if we have those three layers of people in our lives, it really change thing, changes things. And actually recently, I've been talking about that a lot as it relates specifically to business. Mm-hmm. And my wife and I are having some conversations about some other things the other day. And she's like, well, you talk about this thing with business, but 
you don't have it over here in these pieces of your life. And I was like, oh, right. <laughs> and so all of a sudden she's pointing out, she's using my own, you know, my own material that I'm teaching other business owners. And I'm really talking about business. I'm talking about life in general, but it's, I'm really focused on business a lot of the times. And she's like, well, what about, you know, with faith and parenting and marriage? Like where are, where is your mentor in those areas? And I was like, that's a harder question to answer. And, um, so it's easy to get sidetracked. We're running out of time. I, you and I could talk all day long about this stuff because I think we both love it. And, and like you said, I said earlier, business is really hard. And you said it also can be really fun. And both those things are true. It, right. It's both and, right? It's really yeah, hard. Absolutely. And it can be really fun. I mean, I love, 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 love getting to run the business that I do. And some days it's more challenging than I planned or expected. But those challenges also are the places where you grow. I mean, those are the parts where it's like when the pain comes, that's where you kind of figure out a way to dig out. When you dig out, that's where you learn. Um, as, we, as we wrap up, what I'd love for you to kind of think about is what's some parting advice? If, if you're sitting down talking with a business owner, maybe it's somebody who's only been in business for a handful of years and they're just trying to figure out how to make this thing work. They're trying to go, is this thing going to work? How, how do I get it to last? You know, here, Jay and Bill are running companies now that have been around for dec decades that is a lot easier to wrap your head around mm -hmm. than my company who's, I've only been here two or three years. Can I, can I make it to five? Can I make it to 10? What advice would you give those people as we wrap up today? Well, you know, first thing to remember, right? You, you, when you state those two numbers, can I make it to five? Can I make it to 10? Again, statistically, 85% of, of businesses that start won't hit five years. That's right. Right. So if you're, you know, if you're making it to that point, you're already in, in rare company. Uh, but, but if you're at year two, right, year three, and you're looking at that piece of the puzzle. The most important thing is, number one, know your numbers, mm -hmm. right? If you don't know your numbers, you can, the rest doesn't matter, right? What does it cost you to operate your company from a cash flow perspective, right? Don't get caught up in your p and right? Mm -hmm. What does it cost you to run your company from a cash flow perspective? And then you have to charge what you need to charge. And then the second element to that comes into, well, if you say, well, I can't possibly charge that much, first, first you're wrong, right? Mm -hmm. The second question is, all I got to do is build more value, right? And, and, and yeah, again, I don't care what you do, right? You're providing a value and the value goes way beyond the actual product that, that you, right? When I'm talking to a, to a heating and cooling contractor, they don't sell furnaces and air conditioners right? They sell comfort and peace of mind, mm -hmm. right? You know, they sell relief from asthma. When I'm talking to a landscaper, they're not selling lawn care, right? They're, they're, uh, they're selling, the, you know, the peace and the gorgeous view as I'm sitting on the deck enjoying my iced tea, right? Those are, they're, they're selling an experience, right? So, you got to look at that piece of it. And so, you build that extra value in there, right? As you're doing that, um, and then, Along with that is, is, you know, that idea that we talked about, kind of a recap is uh, having a mentor, have some, having somebody else to look at your business and, and tell you what, uh, you know, what makes sense and to challenge you a little bit different. I think those things are so key. Um, as you go through those things, um, you know, one of the things I've been challenging my team with over the last uh, uh, really four months is look at the experience from the customer's perspective. Mm. Right? Don't look at it from, the, you know, from your vantage point. Look at the experience from the customer's perspective and how do they see what you do. Hmm. Right? And, and, and it, it changes the way that you do what you do. Right? When all of a sudden I go through this and, and you know, yes, it's functional, but does it, does it, how does it look if I were buying this product right? if from somebody else? Right, and, and, and by doing that, it starts to change the way uh, that you look at really your, your, um, your products, your services, and what you do. Um, and if you do that, it enables you, I think, to build in the additional value, right, that doesn't cost anything else, right? These little things that you can do that, that, to change what you're offering, and all of a sudden the value goes up, which means the price goes up, which means your, your margins go up, which means your profitability goes up, which means, again, you have margin not only in your company, but you have margin in your life. And that's, that's so important. That's really good advice. Um, Bill, it's just been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show today. I think that the 
info and the wisdom from this conversation that you've shared is going to be really helpful out there to people that have listened. Um, if you're out there and you're thinking, gosh, I'd love to hear more from Bill, maybe look at some of these trainings and, and help run a more profitable business, go check out his free webinar. You can get it at grandyassociates.com. Just go in there and click free webinar and uh, you can get access to his training. Obviously, Bill's focused really heavily on some of the service and trades business, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, as he talked about, but a lot of those concepts can apply to a lot of different businesses. Uh, it, it, it would apply to mine as well. So Blocking and tackling is blocking and tackling, right? That's right. Absolutely. Bill, thanks so much for being on the show. It's been a real pleasure. Absolutely, Jay. Appreciate you being here. Thanks. Hey, I hope this video has helped you with some tips and ideas to build a business that lasts. Make sure you subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss out on the next videos that we roll out. And more importantly, for some awesome free resources, head over to our website at buildingabusinessthatlasts.com. You can get a free copy of my book there where I tell you how I have built an agency that's grown year over year for the last 20 years in a row. So go grab that, buildingabusinessthatlasts.com, and make sure to subscribe to our channel. Thanks. We'll see you soon.